Professor Stein. By interviewing emeritus eminent scholars, I am hoping to record aspects of the history of the law faculty at Cambridge that might otherwise go undocumented. Mm -hmm. Your legal career extends over 60 years to the immediate post-war era, while your memories extend to before the war. During the course of our conversations, I hope you'll be able to reminisce on some of the illustrious academics whose careers began in the pre-war years, as well as your own, and recounting your own experiences over the second half of the 20th century. If you agree, perhaps we can follow a chronological agenda and begin with your early life, which covers the period 1926 to 47. Yeah. You were born in Liverpool, and your father was a solicitor. Yes. Well, he was a, a, a barrister when I was a, born, but he... Um, it was in the 30s, and uh, uh, in the, he, he didn't do very well as a barrister, so he decided in the mid-30s to s switch and become a solicitor, which wasn't a very uh, common thing in those days, because uh, solicitors were regarded as socially inferior <laughs> to barristers. But... Uh, and I re always remember, and it had an effect on me, that uh, in order to be honourably disbarred from the bar, he had to pay Gray's in £20, <laughs> which was quite a lot of money in those days. <laughs> and considering that it was penury that was making him do it, I always thought that was rather mean. Uh, uh. And that was partly why I, I never contemplated going to the bar myself, but became a solicitor. But uh, uh, you were exposed to the law, therefore, throughout your childhood. Well, uh, a little bit, but I was a classicist at school, and I took the scholarship exam in Cambridge as a classicist, and when I came up as a naval cadet in, in the, I think it was April 44, at the beginning of the uh, Easter term, uh, I uh, had to ch do uh, uh, an academic subject as well as naval things like ah. navigation. Ah. And so... Uh, I, um, I I was I carried on with classics. Then I didn't really decide to switch from classics to law until I was away from Cambridge in the navy. And uh, as I th more I thought about it, the more I um, thought I didn't really want to go back to classics and. Uh, forgotten a lot of Latin and Greek and uh, so I made up my mind then that I would switch to law and become a solicitor and uh, so when I came back in 47 I was away for three years from 44 to 47 and uh, in the latter part of that they, the Navy enrolled me on a course to learn Japanese. How interesting. Um, so um, just coming back briefly to your your school life, you were at Liverpool College in 1938. Yes, that's the yes, just going back a little bit. Was there any particular reason that you went to this particular school? Well my father had been at it <laughs> and he was very keen that I should go to it. And um, did you? And eventually, I got a scholarship that covered all the fees. Because I, I had a brief look at the website, and it's about eight thousand pounds these days. Oh, so it was it's quite expensive. Forty-five. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did your classical background start at school? Yes. Just so you mentioned your Greek as well as your Latin. You did both of these at oh, school. Oh yes, of course. And did this fire your interest in Roman history? Um, well, it, it, it made it 
easier when I did Roman law to because I could translate the texts without too much difficulty. You began uh, pre-war at the Liverpool College. Did the war affect your school life? Um, well, I wasn't evacuated or anything like that. The, um, the, the number of boys at the school, it, it was purely boys. And the number of boys at the school uh, reduced considerably during the war. A lot of people went away from them because, and the school itself was bombed. <laughs> but um, I, I insisted on, I stayed, I, I didn't board, I stayed with my grandmother, my father's mother who continued to live in Liverpool. And uh, she looked after me and I cycled to school Gosh. every day. Hmm. It's quite a long way, it was about five miles. <laughs> That's five times Grange Road. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Sir. Huh. So we come then to the war, which you've touched upon, and um, may I ask what was your role? You were in the Navy, yes. the Royal Navy. Well, um, I, I started just as an ordinary sailor, but um, as I say, I, I heard about the uh, Japanese courses and uh, eventually I was enrolled on one uh, to learn Japanese in Bedford because Bedford was near Bletchley where the, um, the interceptions were being made. And how did you find learning Japanese, having done Greek and Latin? Oh, well, it doesn't feel like learning a language. It's more like a sort of crossword puzzle. <laughs> oh. But um, I quite enjoyed it. It was very intensive. It lasted for six months. But I... And that was in the summer of 45 by then. And um, so... I'm just, I was just I'm fascinated that you learned Japanese and uh, did you find you put it to use during no, that no. time? No, no. It was only to translate it. We were the lowest of the low. Uh, Interpreters uh, spent uh, much longer at it uh, and were much uh, uh, more advanced. But um, I was trained just to translate intercepted radio messages. Um, oh, which were trans put into Roma G, which is um, Roman letters. Gosh. Yeah. It's very interesting. So, where were you posted? Um, well, I, I, I um, for a while, um, I, I finished the course. Um, just about the time that the war ended and they dropped by the dropping of the atom bombs bombs on Hiroshima um, but um, did you see active service? Um, no, no and you finished your service in 1947 yes uh, um, I was commissioned as a, as a translator but um, they didn't know what to do with me because the Americans had taken over all the uh, translation. They had, after all, Americans who were of Japanese descent okay. and who knew Japanese uh, and were much more suited to translating than we were. But... Um, <coughs> I, they, they cast around for something that we could do and eventually decided that I should be a, uh, what they called an EVT officer which is educational and vocational training which largely meant uh, handing out leaflets to sailors who were going to be demobilized 
as to what openings there were, oh. you know, welding and mm. all these various trades. And uh, that was quite, quite interesting and not very exciting. And uh, I was sent uh, to uh, the Far East and I was uh, stationed in Singapore oh. for a while because I was um, uh, education officer on the um, on an island off Singapore main island which was uh, a naval base called HMS Sultan so were you, do you remember the ship that you traveled on um, well uh, it was a uh, um, I, I can't. I can't remember the name. Oh, it was called. I think called. Was it called Eastern Prince? Or something like that. I, I honestly don't. Um, I kept a diary then, and I, 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 I could check that. That would be interesting. Perhaps next time we meet. Um, it must have been quite exciting to have gone out. Yes, I'd never been out of out of uh, Britain before. I, I set off for the Far East and uh, we went as far as uh, Ceylon as it ah, then was, yes. Sri Lanka now, and uh, I reported to the uh, sort of chief education officer in Tinkamali huh. and he sent me to Singapore. So eventually I arrived in Singapore. And uh, you know, I found that fascinating. It, it must have been. Do you have any impressions that stand out? Uh, recollections? Not really. Um, I did a bit of broadcasting then <laughs> because the um, uh, there was a, a, a service called the British. Far Eastern Broadcasting Service and they needed readers to read these educational scripts about important figures like Delius and oh, so on. And uh, so uh, I did a test and they thought my voice was then was uh, quite suitable. So I used to go and, uh, and, and uh, broadcast occasionally for them. Oh, lovely. <laughs> and it was around about this time that you were thinking of your career. Yes. And you perhaps at this time applied to go to Gonville and Keys? No, well, um, I'd already got a, a an exhibition in classics ah. there because I took the scholarship exam at Keys before I came up as a cadet and I'd been at Keys as a cadet. Um, because my father had been at Keys in fact, and my mother was at Cambridge as well though she never graduated because women weren't allowed to graduate <laughs> in, in those days though they weren't members of the university it was pretty shocking and uh, what was her subject? Oh, she was a modern linguist but mm -hmm. for um French and Italian, but um, no, I, I um, and then uh, my father was a fanatical Kean, and I was christened in the chapel. I was born in Liverpool, but I was brought to Cambridge at a few months old in order to be christened in Keys Chapel. That's your your middle name. Yes. I wondered about that. Yes. 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 That's interesting. And um, so, you found yourself at Gonville and Keys from 1947 yes, to and 1950. Yes, that, that's when I came out of the navy. Yes. So, did it feel strange being back in a civilian situation? Oh well, well, yes, but we had to work quite hard. We had. Uh, catch up and I'd, uh, if you were ex-service 
you got all sorts of concessions, but you had to take it, you know, do everything quickly. So I did law, law qualifying too, um, and uh, that was really when I became interested in Roman law, because I had Dalba as a supervisor, wow. and he was a very inspiring teacher. Very interesting. I hope to come back to him when we talk about your time at Aberdeen. Yes. Um, uh, did you find Cambridge a strange place? No, not mm. not really, no. Well, see, I'd been a few months there, three years before. Any particular recollect recollections of the college, life at college? Um, well, being an exhibitioner, I had... I lived in college. I lived in college for the whole time. I never had have lodgings outside, which was very convenient. And uh, I made a number of friends who I still have. In fact, last Saturday, uh, I went to dinner. Uh, it was about the 60th. Reunion, oh, lovely. Of the of my contemporaries, and uh, keys. I so there, was there a fairly large group of you, then who who met last Saturday? Uh, no, we've, we've reduced now in numbers from oh. death and yes, gosh. So um, the staff members at from that period. And I wasn't. I, I didn't. I, yes. <laughs> I didn't do law till uh, f 47. Right. I'd done classics when I was up f before, and I switched when I came back. And faculty members whom you would have encountered include emeritus professors Winfield and Guthrie. Yes, and I never met them. Perhaps professors Holland? Yes, I had lectures from Holland and uh, um, Emlyn Wade. Oh. But I didn't do international law. You, uh, in those days, you you chose to do international law or something else. And uh, in law qualifying two, uh, Roman law and in international law were mutually exclusive, oh. so you did one or the other. So you, you might have had Professor Duff? Well, yeah, I went to a few lectures, but of course I, I uh, succeeded him. Oh. Um, any recollections of Sir Hirsch Lauterpacht? No. Oh. And of the list of lecturers that um, we have here? Yeah, well, yes, when, when I came back. Uh, the dominating figure was was Hampson, really. He was regarded generally as the most sort of interesting lecturer. He did the contract lectures. Um, I, I personally didn't find him quite as inspiring as a lot of other people, but um, I attended his course in contract. He had a house in Cranmer Road. Yes. Any other recollections um, of people on this list? Perhaps something about well, David uh, Dalber in this uh, time? Yes, well, d d um, being at Keyes, you see, we, we didn't have a, a, a law fellow. D Dalber was at Keyes, but... He, um, he was an ex-fellow, partly, I think, for dietary reasons. He was an Orthodox Jew, and it was difficult for him to eat in college. So but uh, he supervised me, and um, I got to know him quite well. And uh, it was he who sort of kept up my interest in Roman law. 
So um, when he moved to Aberdeen, he needed someone to help him. So he offered me a job. In um, about 1953 or so, that you moved up to Aberdeen um, quite, a, well, quite a bit later. No, um, I felt, um, I, I, see, I, 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 I graduated in '49 um, as the BA took the law tribe was then and uh, because uh, I could get away with two years solicitor's articles if I took if took it then at that stage how otherwise I might have stayed a little longer in Cambridge uh, but uh, I, I wanted to take full advantage of these concessions so I graduated in '49, and then I discovered that you could do the LLB, as it then was, ah. in, in externally. Um, so I, I, I said that I would do that, and uh, various friends lent me their lecture notes, and so I, I prepared for the LLB while I was doing the first year of my articles, and I was articled to my father's firm in South East London and uh, so um, this would have been in about after your, well, in the, in the early 50s perhaps? Well yeah, f 50, well, I started my articles in 49, 49. and uh, yes and, and did two years articles and I qualified in 51 as a solicitor. But in those days you had to take separate exams um, to become a solicitor. And uh, So, um, just camp before we move from your time at Conville and Keys, presumably David Dahl was the most influential person. Oh, yes. Can, do you have any specific recollections of him during this time? Well, it's difficult to separate uh, those times when I was an undergraduate to later on yes. when I, I was living around the corner in Aberdeen. But I mean, I suppose it partly because I was a decent Latinist from the time that I'd been a classicist that he. He took an interest in me, and uh, I think he more, more or less decided that if I was willing, I would be his assistant. Yeah. But um, I, uh, uh, just before I finished my articles in '51, I began to apply for jobs, and uh, I applied for an assistant lectureship at Nottingham and also for a fellowship to go to Italy to um, to do Roman law and I got both fortunately Gosh. but I, I I opted to go to Italy and uh, but when I um, was away uh, Nottingham said well will you still come be an assistant lecturer and uh, they beat me, they, the, 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 I think uh, the salary scale then was 450 <laughs> a year and uh, but they said in view of my age, I was 26, they would uh, give me 500 so uh, I, I I went to Nottingham uh, for a year and agreed to stay for a year but uh, 
uh, Aberdeen wrote in that time and said, will you come here to do Roman law? And uh, so I said, well, I, I'm committed to spending a year in Nottingham. And uh, I didn't then after that in uh, um, whenever it was uh, in f 52, 52. I, I went I moved um, no sorry I was in Italy uh, in from 51 to 52 and then I was at Nottingham from 52 to 53 and uh, then in 53 that was the year I got married for the first time and then I um, moved to Aberdeen ah. so um, just briefly coming before we move away from your time at Convent yeah. Keys um, Professor Stein, do you have any memories of Professor Lipstein during that period? No, I, mean, I must have met him, but... I... And Clive Perry? No, not no. really. So See, they, um, they were in a different field? Yes. Yes. So you were at... You actually became a solicitor in 1951... And you practiced? No, I didn't. Really. You didn't? No. Right. I was, uh, having done my articles, I was qualified to practice, but I always preferred academic I see. life. Yeah. And I, I, when I was in Italy, I was in a college, college founded by one of the few millionaire saints in the calendar. Most <laughs> saints are pretty poor, but this man... Uh, St. Charles Borromeo was uh, fabulously wealthy and his family owned the Borromeo Islands on Lake Maggiore and um, So in Nottingham did you have any recollections um, of anybody there? Well I was there with my friend um uh, Thomas, uh, J A C Thomas. I didn't realise he was from Nottingham. Well, no, he was it's from uh, from here. He'd been at Trinity, and I'd known him slightly, but he was ahead of me in Cambridge. But he was very kind to me when I went to Nottingham. But he was also interested, of course, in Roman law, and uh, we eventually shared the course. Um, and did half each, but uh, yeah, I also had to teach contract and uh, conveyancing, because being a solicitor, it was assumed that I knew all about <laughs> conveyancing, right. and uh, so I was quite busy. Um, I was in lodgings in Nottingham, and you um, decided to go to, um, to Aberdeen. Yeah, well, uh, they wrote and offered me a job while I was in, in uh, Nottingham. And, uh, but, and I knew that this would mean I could go on with Roman law. Which was your main interest. Yes. So... You became a lecturer in jurisprudence in Aberdeen yes. in 1953. That's right. To 56. Yeah. Yes, I, I um. And then you were. Yes, you had the, the two subjects were joined together: Roman law and jurisprudence. And uh, so. Um, and you became the professor in jurisprudence in 1956. Yes, well, Dalba moved. He was professor of jurisprudence with responsibility both for Roman law and jurisprudence. But he 
he was appointed to the Regis Chair in Oxford in 55 when de Zulueta died and uh, so uh, I had to carry on uh, for a while as a lecturer in charge and then I eventually they appointed me to succeed Dalber in 56. I was quite happy because my mother was a Scot. I, no I uh, noticed in Who's Who she had a Scottish surname. Oh, yes. Yes. So you felt at home in Aberdeen? Uh, reasonably, though my mother thought our Aberdeen was the Arctic Circle because you know, she came from Edinburgh. It, it, so she did occasionally come and see us. <laughs> It must have seemed been more remote in those times, Aberdeen, than it is today. Yes. You know, it's had the, all that oil. Yeah, that um, was long boom. before the oil. Y yes. And uh, it was just a, a, a real sort of granite, yes. austere city. It was pretty austere, but I enjoyed it there, and uh, there were plenty of grants to enable you to go away to libraries if you needed, and. Uh, I, uh, and you, of course, were close to Daub, very close to Daub during this time. Well, we only, yes, uh, I was only close to him for two years before he moved, because he moved in 55 to uh, Oxford. So was he just down the passage? Oh, um, yes. Uh, yes. And I used to go and uh, discuss my dissertation uh, with him at his home. Uh, the, um, because th there was a problem, should I get a, a Scottish legal qualification? I thought there was no reason why I, I couldn't be a solicitor in England and an advocate in Scotland, yes. but I discovered that there was some uh, agreement that you couldn't do that. So uh, uh, I thought, well, I must. Well, people said you must have some sort of Scottish legal qualification. So I, I did a PhD at Aberdeen, and uh, a little bit in Scots law. Did he supervise you? Down. Yes. Yes, he suggested the topic, which was culpa in contrahendo, which is uh, uh, well, I, I, that was the title in effect of my dissertation, which was fault in the formation of contract. Fascinating, and so presumably you. Um, had, um, you know, he was a very, I would think, super supportive supervisor. Oh, yes. No, he was an excellent teacher. And, uh, no, I suppose he's influenced me more than any other. I any recollections? of him during this period? Well, I remember, you know, s sitting in his study in Osborne Place, Aberdeen, <laughs> um, ac across the fire. Oh, sounds lovely. But, um, uh, so, uh, Professor Lipstein told me that, um, when he first came here in 1934, he was doing Roman law, but he quickly decided to give it a miss because Darba was here as well. Yes. And he was, by Professor Lipstein's, in his own words, he was much better at it. Well. So Professor Lipstein concentrated on private international law. Yes. Yes. So was, was he a, a very a, a kind man, Darba? Oh, yes. As well as being very brilliant, he was... Very oh, he kind. was a very generous man general with his time and affection. Yes. 
necessary. It was it must have been so. Uh, quite a loss when he moved when he went to. Yes, I was very upset at the time, but I liked Aberdeen very much, and uh, I think I might have stayed there. But the, the main problem was that. Uh, you, you never had any graduate students there because once they graduated, we all stay with they went away. Well, it was partly the policy to send them either to Oxford, or Cambridge, or to Ameri an American university to get further experience. And uh, I noticed in your article in Jewish Subrooted that you you said that. Roman law really was a London, Cambridge, Oxford subject. Yes. <clears throat> well, you see, although every university then had to have some sort of elementary course in Roman law because you needed it for the bar, but um, the only ones that really uh, had sort of chairs in Roman law were uh, Oxford, Cambridge and London and, uh, and the Scottish universities because Roman law was much more influential in Scotland than, than in England. So you, you were very young when you became the professor in jurisprudence, um, you were only 30. Yes. Um, that, that must have been yes, one I of the youngest very, very lucky. appointments. Uh, well, yes, Aberdeen did sometimes appoint people young. Two of the professors, when I became professor there, were had, had been younger than I was when they started. Professor Greek and one of the divinity professors. Um, but uh, I was very lucky. You became Dean of the Law Faculty at Aberdeen well, in 1961. <laughs> really? Yes, and this was lasted until 68. Do you have any recollections of your time um, in this office? Well, he, the, there were only three professors, the professor of Scots law, the professor of jurisprudence and the professor of conveyancing, ah. who was part-time. And uh, they took it in turns to be dean, which just meant you chaired faculty meetings. So, so uh, yes. Do you have any other reminiscences of your time in Aberdeen, of the faculty, perhaps the King's College site? The, the law had been located in old Aberdeen on the King's College site before I came there. And um, it was in a converted church because the Scots are always um, rearranging their ecclesiastical arrangements and, uh, you know, the Free Church and the United Free and all that. But um, no, I, I, I felt We, we were lucky with the, the library there um, and then I could, well, De Zulueta had been in Oxford, sold his own library, a private library of Roman law books to Aberdeen hmm. uh, before he died. and. Uh, So I had this nucleus of Roman law in the library there, and they very kindly agreed to 
maintain it. They, they, they bought more or less anything that I asked for. So you must have developed the library's collections yes. considerably. At Aberdeen, yes. Yes. I, d- I did. And the, the subject itself, because um, it's still very strong, isn't it? Well, it's... Fortunately, the present principal, uh, who's a historian, but he did Roman law with me while he was an undergraduate oh. in arts. He could do it in arts or in law. And uh, he's very keen to maintain Roman law. Who is he, Professor? Duncan oh. Rice. Right. R-I-C. Did you find the differences between English and Scottish, the Scottish legal and educational systems quite... Oh, well, yes, you have to keep separate in your mind. But uh, I never did get a, a Scottish professional qualification. I, did, I, uh, I mean, I had the Aberdeen PhD. Uh, but um, otherwise I stayed as an English solicitor well I sweated blood to become an English solicitor <laughs> I didn't really want to <laughs> did give you it up uh, no yeah. um, meeting up with David Daub again um, introduced you to people like King, who had an influence on oh, your yes. research, you mentioned... Well, Dava used to be a great one for inviting people to come to Aberdeen, and uh, I met Cohen quite early and uh, talked to him about his plans, and I was one of the first people on the Scientific Council of his Max Planck Institute for Legal History. And uh, I kept in touch with what he was doing because I always felt that it was a little bit artificial to stop uh, studying Roman law with Justinian, that one should really go on and discuss uh, and study what had happened in the Middle Ages, uh, the mm. Us Commune, and all that. Yes. But uh, so going was in the forefront of that, but also there were other important uh, figures for Roman law, like Casa. So did, did you meet him in, in this time? Yes, yes. Also through David Dalber. Mm, yes, but by the, this, by the time I became professor myself, I used to go to conferences of course. and meet people. There. Yes. So that yes. was... Any re- recollections of going or cars? Well... <laughs> I suppose... Uh, uh, anyway. Uh, I see you've got down my colleagues. Yes. Yeah, um, the, I suppose the dominant personality in Aberdeen was T.B. Smith, who later became Sir Thomas Smith when he moved to Edinburgh. Right. But he dominated Aberdeen. He revived law, which had previously been a sort of part-time study and uh, so I mean if you think of in comparison with other disciplines the formalizing of legal studies was a relatively late yes. development is, you know which well it had always sort of hung on by its fingertips but Gosh. because the chair of law which was Scots law uh, became um, 
who had been there from the beginning. But uh, whereas jurisprudence was a new foundation, and there was a, a principal of the university who was a lawyer who had previously been professor of Scots law, Sir Thomas Taylor, and he was very influential. Well, that takes us up to the end of your time at Aberdeen, and... Yes, I can't rem yeah. I'm afraid I can't remember yeah. very clearly. I um, left a Aberdeen in... Uh, 68? 68, yes. That was when Professor Duff retired. Yeah. And you and I was obtained his chair. To succeed. Yes. yes. I was never elected. You're always, because the Regis chairs you are a point. Yeah. It's one of the most prestigious chairs. I'm a, chairs. I'm a, a, a Harold Wilson appointment. I see. Ah. Because yeah. the, the letter I got from Downing Street says, Mr. Wilson, I'd <laughs> uh, like to give your name to Her Majesty. So I wrote, <laughs> said, yes, please. <laughs> so you, you must have left Aberdeen with mixed feelings. I mean, oh, yes. you liked it there very much. I did. And it, 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 it was with mixed feelings, but I felt, well, bit more wider opportunities uh, in, in Cambridge and of course I knew Cambridge although I've been away for, for in, in, in effect nearly 20 years yes that's right I mean you you know you were I came down yes uh, in 49 and it was 68 but you'd already mapped out your career by the time you came back to Cambridge. You'd already established your well, yourself as a world no, I, 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 authority. I knew I could hang on to that chair. And, and that was, I mean, in a way that was my ambition, to get one of the Regis chairs. And uh, I knew Duff. And I think Duff and Dalber uh, probably recommended me to the patronage secretary of the Prime Minister, who's the person who actually made the appointment in those days. Interesting. Well, perhaps next time we can talk about your time at Cambridge and your colleagues at Cambridge and um, I might just ask, be able to ask you about the background to some of your your books um, so um, I, no, I notice uh, do, do you actually have a bibliography Professor Stein which I might uh, look at probably somewhere I'll look so it. what I've compiled so far I, it strikes me that you wrote a good many books, long works. Well, I mean, that, that's the, the last, last one. Yes, which is translated. The only one I made any money out of. <laughs> that's translated into a number of languages. I was um, looking at it myself, and uh, I, it, it seems to me to be quite an accessible text which is why I'm going to buy it, because I would like to read it as well. Um, mm. And I don't like reading these library books because um, of what people do to them. Oh, dear. I find that very annoying. I know, it is. And, uh, you know, so it's um, it looks like a, a book which... Um, somebody... Yes, it was originally published in German ah. because it was commissioned right. by Fischer Verlag for a series of pocket books, Taschen book. Oh. And uh, interesting. Yeah. Well uh, but I made the condition that I I wrote it in English and and they translated it or they 
we arranged a friend of mine, a German professor, he volunteered to translate it into German. So that and the great attraction from my point of view was that there were pictures you could have so I could choose about a dozen pictures.